Okay, I think we should start our seminar. So welcome everyone to the brand new semester. And this semester we have launched a new series of Wednesday lunchtime seminar, which focus on what do we do after graduation. So this seminar series combine different science talk, a career panel, or workshop, a workshop that talk about different skills developing during the PhD. And we will also talk about the diverse um, options, career options after obtaining a geology degree. So the first seminar will be given by Margaret. And then she is a very professional writer, editor, and science communicator. And in the following seminar, she will describe her experience, how she got her current position. If you have questions about how you, how should we, oh, if you have questions to her experience, <laughs> feel free to write your questions in the chat and we will answer them at, at the end of the talk. Thank you. So thanks everyone. Um, uh, as Grace said, I'm Margaret Carruthers and uh, I have a degree in geology. I, um, I have a bachelor's in natural resources, which was forestry and geology and a master's in geology. And I'm gonna talk about a little bit about what I do now, my current career, and then how I got here. And um, as Grace said, please um, feel free, we'll, I'll answer any questions that you want. If you want to put them in the chat to, to keep them in your head for now, that would be great. Um, and we can talk about anything that you, that you all need. need. Um, so I'm gonna share my screen. Please also let me know if you have any technical problems or you see that I'm not, you know, I'm. it seems like I may be showing you something that you can't see, for example. Okay. So can you all see my slide, my title slide? Okay. All right. So um, I'll start off a little bit. When I, I went to, um, uh, I studied geology because, not because I necessarily had any great plans to, to do something great in geology or some pressing question that I wanted. It, it just was something interesting and fun and I could spend a lot of time outside. <laughs> um, so uh, I am now a science writer. Um, I am, I work at the Space Telescope Science Institute, which is here in Baltimore City. Um, as a science writer, I am involved in developing uh, articles, videos, you know, news releases, brochures, really anything um, that the Institute needs to get out the word about what the Institute does or astronomy in general to the general public or the astronomy community or even say Congress or other, um, you know, people that need to know what we're doing. Um, the Space Telescope Science Institute, in case you're not familiar with it, is <clears throat> um, runs the science operations for the Hubble Space Telescope. You all can see my slides, okay? Okay, great. For Hubble, which is coming up on its 35th and uh, 31st rather anniversary um, in space, orbiting Earth. Um, so all of the data from Hubble come down to Earth and are uh, sent to the Space Telescope Science Institute, where we um, do the processing, get it ready for the astronomers. And we also, almost all of the beautiful imagery that you see from Hubble uh, is developed um, at STSCI, STSCI in Baltimore. Um, some of it goes through ESA in Europe. Um, and all of the press releases, almost all of the press releases, if you hear about a Hubble discovery, um, it comes is coming out of our news office, our Office of Public Outreach. Um, and that's been, STSCI has been around for 40 years now. This is, uh, so it was actually in operation nine or 10 years before Hubble was launched. Um, the other things that the STSCI, S, sorry, space telescope. I'm just going to call a space telescope. Um, 
does. We also are managing science operations for the James Webb Space Telescope and also mission control. So Webb will be launching in October. It's scheduled for launch Halloween, this Halloween, um, after 20 years in development. Um, so not only will the data come down and we will process the data and get that all ready for astronomers and the public, we will also be controlling the telescope. So this is actually in the mission control um, room. Um, and in the office in Baltimore, and they will be sending uh, um, signals up, you know, to the telescope to tell them what to do. And we'll also be managing the Nancy Grace Roman Space Telescope, which launches in about five years. So that's what we do. I am in the public of Office of Public Outreach, and um, just a very quick, I can do, I can go into more detail later, but um, what we do in the this is the STSCI home uh, website. Office of Public Outreach manages this. We do a lot of writing and design for this. So all the beautiful design work. So there's art in here as well as writing and science. Um, in the Office of Public Outreach, we are, uh, like I said, involved in the websites and the news releases, events um, um, for the public, that sort of thing. As a science writer, um, I am involved in writing news releases. So here's one example of a news release that came out last May about uh, Jupiter and some Hubble information. So we would write this, uh, to work with a scientist, write the text, also work with, um, where are some of the other things? Also work with uh, graphic designers to make um, infographics and, and imagery here. So this is like an example of, of that. Um, I'm just kind of giving you a quick tour here and we can go back to anything you want, but I'm particularly proud of this one because it was very fun to make. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, you know, it's, it's like utilizing my background in, in earth science, but learning new things about astronomy that I never knew before and working with graphic designers and thinking about how we communicate to the public. Um, what is this? Oh, this is another uh, article that I did. This one was about um, the Roman Space Telescope, which at the time was known as the Wide Field Infrared Survey Telescope. So this is getting information to the public about what that will do. Um, we also have general um, articles for the public. So what we call evergreen, so it's not news, it's just background. So here's one I wrote about what the first stars were like. Um, something to point out in this, um, my talk is a little kind of go around in circles and randomly, but one of the, as I think of things, um, I did not study astronomy. Um, I only, I studied earth science, I studied planetary geology, but astronomy was not part of that. So the astronomy that I've learned, I have learned outside of school uh, over the past 10 or 15 years and over the course of being a writer and an educator. And it's just something I wanted to point out because really uh, in our careers, most of the learning that we do is really outside school. Um, of course, it depends on where you are in your career, but uh, learning doesn't end. And so, um, but what I did learn in school was how to research, how to think critically, how to write. Um, and over time, I also learned how to communicate um, with the public. So this article here, what were the first stars like? I had to go and do all that research and figure it out. There was no good uh, public article on that. So I couldn't just sort of like take somebody else's and rewrite it. Um, you know, went back, talked to a lot of experts about it and that sort of thing. So this is very fun. I also worked with um, illustrators, illustrator and designer to create graphics for this and infographics that sort of thing. So um, this is another article that I did. What would Earth's atmosphere look like from Webb? Again, applying what I learned uh, in Earth science to astronomy and bringing in a lot of other other things. We create uh, interactives as well. So this is um, a product called ViewSpace. We have these interactives where you can <clears throat> go and here in this one, we're looking at an object, the Crab Nebula, and we are uh, basically able to look at it in the visible wavelengths um, from Hubble. 
but also look at it in infrared, radio wavelengths, UV, X-ray, multi-wavelength. These interactives are designed to give people an understanding of, in this case, you know, what we can see in different forms of light. But the point thing I wanted to point out here was um, a lot of my work is is figuring out not just the text and the words to write, but how to organize the material and how to what the user experience is like. So this project was not just writing this up, but we actually designed how this was going to work. So um, these are kind of fun things to explore. There's more information for people down here. Um, Again, this is a quick tour and I can give you all the links to these if you're interested in, in this types of things that we do. Um, this is another example of, um, of some of the work we do. We make videos. So this is a short video. Um, and this one is an earth science topic that I was particularly interested in. So I thought, hey, let's do one in this seafloor gravity. Let's I'll write it and find the imagery for it and work with the video designer to put it together. Uh, we also write stuff for our annual report, so that's a slightly different audience. Everything that I write, you know, we have a very specific audience we develop for, and um, it can be anything from professional astronomers to uh, just our stakeholders, as we call them, the people interested in what um, the Institute is doing, or the general public. Um, this is, you know, something from our annual report. And another thing from our annual report that is a lot of design. And then we also do a lot of social media. So we have a Hubble channel and we have a space telescope channel. These are just some of the uh, uh, posts that I've done. Um, uh, and you can follow those and we try to get out to the general public uh, with the Facebook and Instagram and Twitter. And maybe someday we'll do TikTok hip hop videos, who knows. Um, okay, so that gives you some idea what I do right now. Um, are you guys, uh, anybody? Um, I, I can now go into kind of like how I got here, if that would, does that sound good? Or do you guys, yeah? Okay, all right. <laughs> um, I'm not sure I'm seeing everybody on here, okay. So how I got here. All right. So again, I, you know, some people start their career with like, this is what I want to do. I know exactly what I want to do. And they go do it, you know, um, and they make a plan and they, they do it. That wasn't really the case for me. I was interested in a lot of different things. And by the time I got to college, I knew I was probably interested in geology because I did a after school program with the Maryland Geological Survey. Um, and I got really interested. We didn't have geology in high school. They didn't teach it, um, uh, at least not in the program I was in. So that was the only experience I had, but I found it really fascinating. So when I chose which college I went to, I chose it partly because they had a natural science program. So these are some um, of, you know, can you see my screen okay? Yeah, okay, so this was before the age of digital cameras. So this is like, I took my phone the other day and I took pictures of my pictures <laughs> from college. <laughs> so <laughs> um, my point is that, you know, it, in, I think a lot of you all, you know, studied geology in college and uh, I loved being outside. I loved just going on the field trips. I loved dealing with maps and coloring cross sections. <laughs> um, but we also had a lot of uh, other opportunities. I went to a liberal arts college, so it wasn't just focused on one thing. It was a lot of things we did. This is me and an alligator in a, uh, in a program I did. Um, this is people, you know, marsh mucking in, uh, in Georgia. And so the point there is that I did discover in college that I was interested in natural sciences and liked being outside and that kind of thing. Um, I also did a lot of summer jobs. Um, so I had a job at the uh, doing um, working in a bioremediation lab um, at Hopkins. And one thing I discovered that I like the idea of it. It's really cool. So basically I fed sewage to microbes. That was my job. Um, and also running analyses on machines. Um, like, uh, oh, what it was it? I forget. I, 
clearly this was a long time ago, but but I, I put this picture here, the stock photo of these guys having fun in a lab because what I learned from this, I really liked the idea of bioremediation, but what I discovered was this was not me. I did not find this fun. <laughs> I I found it a kind of tedious <laughs> and, and I, I prefer to leave it to somebody else to, to do that work. Um, I also worked at the Maryland Geological Survey and we did a lot of field work and that was a lot of fun. I did enjoy that. So this is just that we did, I did coastal and estuarine geology. Um, and I did a summer um, volunteer conservation project a pro program at Astigue Island National Seashore. And that was, that was wonderful too. Um, so I tried to get lots of experience out there and doing that was important because I found out things that I liked doing and things that I did not like doing. And I think one po point I wanted to make on here, I really felt like I should like this environmental engineering. Like I thought, you know, I should like it and I should do it, but I'm glad that I did not pursue it because it really wasn't what I actually wanted to be spending my days doing, you know? Um, there's a difference between kind of interest and like drive to do something for eight, 10, 12 <laughs> hours a day, right? <laughs> Um, so um, after college, I went to grad school at UMass Amherst and I studied Martian geology. And um, I think part of the reason I studied Martian geology is uh, uh, these broad interests. It allowed me actually to take the broad geology and, and, and apply it in a more broad way than, than say a very focused, super focused project. Um, I tried to do a lot of different things when I was in grad school. So even though I did Martian geology, I did a lot of field work um, in other classes. I helped people out on their field projects. And I also uh, signed up to do be a volunteer on a um, research cruise of the Southern Mid-Atlantic Ridge. Now that had nothing to do with Martian geology, but it had everything to do with finding interests and kind of like building a broad understanding of many different things. Um, uh, not just knowledge, but also kind of social things like, uh, I don't know if you've ever been on a cruise, but it's like kind of a fun social, I don't know, <laughs> it's a different place to be. Um, and that was for five weeks on very rough seas. Um, so grad school. Okay, so that now I'm kind of like a lot of you guys are in grad school trying to figure out what's next, right? Um, when I was in graduate school, so I was at UMass for three years. Uh, in my last year, I had to figure out what am I going to do next? Well, I had never really thought about anything other than school, right? So for college, the next step was, well, why get a job? Just keep going to school. Um, and I wanted to go to school. So the question there was, would I go for getting a PhD? And I did want to get a PhD, but I could not decide what in. I wasn't thinking I wanted to go on with planetary geology. It was too remote, like literally remote. And I wanted some real rock samples. I really envied my colleagues and at in my department who had actual rocks that they could like analyze and go out in the field. And this was even before any of the landers. We were using Viking data from the 1970s. So it wasn't a lot to work with. I really got interested in mid-ocean ridge um, stuff and um, from this cruise. <clears throat> so I almost, you know, I thought about doing that, but I really couldn't decide what I wanted to spend the next five years diving into. So I decided, let me work, I'll go work. Um, so I asked around, I thought, you know what? I do like communicating, I like museums. Maybe I could work in a museum, that would be fun. So. I asked my professors, hey, do you know anybody who works in a museum? And uh, one of my professors said, yeah, I know two people, one guy at the Smithsonian, <clears throat> and I, and that was um, uh, Jim Lur, he knew. And then I know one guy at the American Museum of Natural History, Ed Maté. So I wrote to them both um, and I said, hey, I'm, uh, I'm looking for a job and I would love to work for you. <laughs> and I got an email back from Jim Lawyer who said, we'd love to have you, but we have no money. <laughs> and, um, and then I got an uh, email back from Ed Matte, and he said, actually, my assistant is leaving, so there's a job opening. So I applied for that, and 
you know, other people did too. It wasn't just that I, you know, I didn't just get the job, but I will tell you something. I wanted that job so badly. You cannot believe it. Like I really wanted that job. I wanted to move to New York. I wanted to work at the American Museum of Natural History. And honestly, I think other people were probably more qualified for the job because the, um, but I think my enthusiasm is what made it. Um, so I worked there for four years. And in that time, um, we were developing the Hall of Planet Earth, which um, here's a picture of that exhibit, part of that exhibit hall. Um, and so I got to be involved in uh, um, collecting some of the samples, um, not much of the exhibit design, but just a little bit. I was supposed, uh, you know, my job was kind of caring for the rock collection, which was one reason I like rocks. They don't need a whole lot of feeding and watering. So um, we, uh, but I got to get involved in education that way and, and some outreach. This picture, I will tell you, if you go to New York and go to the Hall of Planet Earth, this rock here, do you see my cursor? Can you see it okay? Okay, this banded iron formation from um, Canada uh, is a piece that um, uh, I went and collected, I personally did, and actually Richard went too. Um, and there's some others. And the other thing that I was really fortunate to go on was a collection of the uh, black smoker chimneys uh, on from the Juan de Fuca Ridge. We went and actually surveyed the area um, on a, from shipboard, and then they sent down robots to chainsaw them down and bring them back to the museum. So these were really important opportunities that I had. Um, now the next, how this relates to where I am now, I discovered in this a couple of things. Number one, I really like education and outreach. I like telling people about the science. I like that a lot more than actually doing the science, okay? Um, I wanted to want to do the science and I actually started doing a little bit of like a research project. I thought I might go to Columbia for grad school because am &H had a program joint with Columbia, thought about doing geochemistry and I just found it just wasn't for me. I just wasn't driven to it. I wasn't as interested in it as I really wanted to be, if that makes sense. And um, I like doing this. Um, the other thing that happened, and this is just by chance, is that at am &H is in New York City, there's a lot of publishing companies there. And the publishers, when they did a trade book, a trade book is basically like a, a book that you buy in the bookstore, say, as opposed to a, a you know, technical manual or a, a textbook. Um, when they did a trade book about geology, they would call up the museum and ask if there would be somebody who would review it, an expert reviewer to make sure it was okay. And nobody in the department wanted to do it except me. And I was all over it because it was like an extra hundred bucks and I wasn't being paid anything hardly. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so they started sending me stuff and I would review this. I would review uh, these books and they would typically be for children written by a science, a writer who may or may not have a whole lot of experience actually with the content. And so the quality of the, of the material was kind of all over the place. Sometimes it was really good and I would just have to kind of like make a few corrections. And sometimes it was like they went to the library the day before and took some random book off the shelf and just write their own book and just made up some stuff in between. And so, <laughs> What I realized there was a couple things. Number one, I had something to offer that people could use. Like I had a skill and knowledge set that was useful. Number two, I really enjoyed it. I enjoyed reviewing it. I enjoyed giving feedback. I enjoyed it. it was a, it's a type of education. I got a lot of satisfaction out of it. Number three, I thought I read some of this and I thought, shoot, I could rate that. So. <laughs> And I thought, well, how am I going to do that? So I, I developed a strategy, which was 
when somebody had written something that I thought could be written better, I would say, you know, this isn't quite right, but here's the way you could do it. And I would just write out a suggested revision. So it wouldn't just be like, rewrite this. I would actually do that because my strategy was maybe if they could see that I could write, they would ask me to write the next book instead of this other random person. And that strategy worked, right? <laughs> Sometimes your plan works. <laughs> um, and they did, they asked me, they started to ask me, hey, would you like to write? So that is how my um, writing and editing kind of career got got taken, taken root. I had a few advantages here. Number one, the American Museum of Natural History, just that name, everyone thinks you're God, even though, you know, I had, I had like the lowliest job there <laughs> that you could have that was in the science department. Um, and, um, and so I was at the right, you know, in the right place at the right time uh, in some in some respects. Um, the other thing I found about writing and editing, I just found it very satisfying because at the end of the day, I had something like something was done. And I found in grad school, I found it very frustrating. I found that, you know, weeks and months would go by and I didn't feel like I was getting anywhere. And that was really hard. Um, so that's part of the reason um, that I kind of made that switch. Um, so after that, um, then I um, basically I got a lot. I got some, you know, I got book contracts. Um, so here are some of the books that I worked on um, that I wrote. Um, these were mostly by word of mouth. OK, I did not actually pitch book ideas. They came to me and said, we need a writer to do this or that or the other. Um, it's a much easier way. This is very satisfying to have books on the shelf with your name on it. It's wonderful doing the research. I just love doing it. There's a catch though, which is that, <clears throat> you know, when they talk about starving writers, um, I always thought that meant writers who were no good and didn't have contracts and didn't actually publish. It actually means most writers, okay? So in this in this context, so these don't pay a lot, and it's I could do this because um, after I, because um, Richard and I got married, and when we I left the museum, we moved to England, and you know, and I could do it because um, you know I had because he was paying the bills, although we really had very little money <laughs> anyway. But I could do it. And otherwise, I would be doing this in my free time, you know, out, outside of other work. Um, so that's just something to be aware of. Um, however, let's go on. <laughs> there is, um, there. what I discovered was later is that there's all sorts of other writing work. And it's not to do with writing books. It's in um, other forms of the industry, and here's just a few. It was in the education, ex educational publishing industry. So I got into that. You know, I answered maybe, maybe it was a, there was an ad maybe for um, editing um, some curriculum work for this company called Words and Numbers. We were living in Silver Spring at the time. Um, and this company was in Baltimore and they basically worked with all the big educational publishers. So educational publishers, especially in K-12, they typically don't actually write their own materials. Even the name on the front of the book might not actually be the author, the person who actually wrote it. They subcontracted out to these uh, development houses. So I um, joined a company called Words and Numbers, and this was a full-time job with benefits, et cetera, et cetera. So now uh, I was working, actually writing, you know, reading passages, uh, lab manuals, um, interactive, you know, eventually we got into digital, um, inter digital uh, textbooks. So we were writing, um, you know, lessons, a lot of standardized test prep. So uh, depending on when you went to school, you might have seen some of the questions I wrote. Um, but this was good. And, and what was, again, interesting about this is that 
there are a lot of people in educational publishing who know about education. There are a lot of people from the humanities side, the science side, there are fewer. And it was a real, uh, it was very important for them to have people who knew what they were talking about working on these things. Because otherwise, you know, I'm sure you've come across lots of things. You're like, hey, that's not right. Who wrote this? They don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> and it's true because people are given an assignment to write and they have to go do their research and they may or may not really understand what's going on. So this, I really enjoyed this work as well. Um, eventually, you know, other factors came in and I left that company. But the other, the thing that this also moved me into was, um, so, so I learned to do writing for a new audience. Um, I learned to write for clients. So it's not writing for myself. It's not writing for, um, it's more very constrained writing. So you're, you have, you have, you might have literally, you know, you have a page, it has to fit in that page. <laughs> you have a lot of constraints. You can't use this word or that word. It has to be a certain reading level. Your client, meaning your publisher has told you all these different rules that you have to follow. So it's a, it's a different type of writing. Um, I like to think of it as a puzzle, really. Uh, think of those constraints as kind of like a fun thing rather than a, a, a annoying, <laughs> annoying thing. Um, I, in this thing, I also learned to manage projects. So we had big projects, big teams, and we had to get things done on time, on deadline. We had to organize files. We had to make sure that everything went to the printer properly um, and got there <laughs> for the client because there's a lot of money involved and there's contracts involved. Um, I had a team, uh, I was head of the science department and then I was head of the science and reading departments. Um, um, you know, at one point I had a team of maybe 20 people. Um, then I also got into proposals and business development from that. So I was managing budgets, but also then effectively sales, but it's like writing a proposal, like the company, uh, a publisher would say, we need somebody to do a text, a, you know, earth science textbook for grade nine and all the ancillary materials like the test prep and the labs we would write a proposal and a bid for that to get that work. So I was on, I was in charge of that. So I had to figure out all the money side, but also kind of like write up why we were the best for that. So that was also very um, satisfying work. Uh, there's a lot of challenges to this work as well, because you're talking about a business that needs to make a profit. So I, I guess the thing I wanted to point out here, I had no previous experience for the for for-profit business world because my mom was in academia so i kind of grew up in the academic academic world this was my first real um experience with that um so there's a lot of learning on the job and i do not have an mba but i would say that probably I have close to it in terms of experience on the job here so um okay then I left words and numbers and I did independent consulting. My slide was not great for that. I didn't finish my slide, so I'm not gonna show you the slide. But basically I did similar work, but um, I was self-employed. Um, I did a lot of writing. I worked for Discovery Education. I worked for Audubon Society. I worked for the American Chemical Society, for Oxford University Press, a whole bunch of different companies, um, University of the Rockies doing all kinds of things. Um, not just in science, some was in social science, some was in, I can't even remember. Um, but basically it was a lot of uh, writing, a lot of conceptualization, figuring out programs, some business development work. Um, and that I was working, I was self-employed. And the thing I wanna say about that is, <clears throat> there's pluses and minuses. <laughs> if you don't have to worry about paying your mortgage, that it's great, it's fine. <laughs> if you have to worry about paying the bills, it's extremely stressful being self-employed. Um, so I can talk more about that later. But then in 2017, I got the job at STSCI and I took that because, I mean, who wouldn't take that? It's an awesome job. It's, you know, learning new things. I work with amazing people, extremely talented people. It's well-paid and has good benefits and it's two miles from my house. 
um, which is farther than the third floor, which is where my office is when I'm was I self self employed, but it's a wonderful job. So that is my spewing of experience. <laughs> and I would love to take any questions that you have. I, I also have like a list of top tips, but we can get to that afterwards. Um, any questions that you have about what I do or how I got here or any, anything you want, really. I'm going to stop sharing. Any questions? Do we have any questions from the audience? I personally love the story. I think it's great. Well, I will have a question. Actually, yeah. I have many questions. Okay, but it's go like, for it. To change from job to another job to another job. Um, sometimes I do worry uh, how to convince the employer that I have those set of skills that mm -hmm. I can do well in the job. In other words, I know I could have the potential of writing a good book or know some background knowledge, but I don't know how to demonstrate those in the CV or even develop them while I'm in the previous stage of my career. Right. So how did you do that? So um, in terms of writing specifically, if, if anybody's interested in getting into science writing, I would highly recommend taking, um, finding small opportunities. So that might be small freelance work. It might be even volunteer work, but basically build up um, some experience that way. It's very low risk on your part because you're not just like suddenly leaving a job and starting somewhere new and moving. It's also low risk on the person who's employing you. They're hiring you for one small job. And, um, <clears throat> and if it doesn't work, if they think you're terrible, they just don't hire you for the next one. And um, the nice thing about writing is there are a lot of freelance opportunities out there. What I would highly recommend if you're interested in doing that is when the things about freelance writing are, <clears throat> and by the way, if this ever anybody gets an opportunity and wants to just talk about it, like with I'm here, I would love to talk to anybody. <laughs> like I can give you specific top tips, but a few things to keep in mind, and this probably applies to anything anyway. Um, writing, professional writing is different from um, say writing for yourself. Like if you're like, oh, I'm gonna write the great American novel, that's a little bit different. Um, professional writing, you have a client that you have to um, satisfy. You have an audience that you are writing to. Um, you have certain criteria that you have to meet. You have guidelines, which are basically your rules and your instructions. The key with that is, especially when you start out all the time, but in particular, when you start out, you need to remember that you are being employed for a job and they don't care what you think. <laughs> And they don't want to know, like if they said, um, if they said, Grace, uh, I need 250 words on um, lemurs <laughs> and it needs to be written for second graders, um, you know, uh, if you can give them the most beautiful piece of writing that's 500 words about dogs for fifth graders and they will say, I do not ever wanna work with you again because <laughs> it's not about your writing skill at that point, it's about uh, following the directions as well as the writing skills. So my recommendation is if you wanna get into writing, find these little opportunities and do a really good job because I'll tell you I worked when I was at words and numbers I was an editor mostly we employed a lot of freelance writers and 80 percent of them were not good <laughs> or I should say maybe I shouldn't say they weren't good 80 percent of them did not give us what we needed okay the ones who did consistently give us what we needed, and that meant following the directions as well as writing well and knowing the content um, for the audience, also getting it in on time. Um, and then also being open to feedback and open to revision and being easy to work with. So 
again, this these lessons probably apply to other things that if people want to get into. It really comes down to do a really good job. <laughs> um, and if you understand what your um, client is looking for, um, whether that means what content, what it's what's the purpose of the piece, but also how they want to work with you. Some people, you, you know, you kind of have to get a feeling for um, how they want to work. Maybe they want to spend an hour talking about it. Maybe they're like, I don't have time for this. Just do it. Who knows? <laughs> There's a lot of people skills involved as well. So it's basically about being easy to work with and being reliable and good at what you do. Um, and that's how I got into this. It was building up freelance work because the way it works is it's a lot of word of mouth. When I was an independent consultant, um, although I told you it was very stressful, I did make a, I worked full time and I made a good living. I just didn't know if I would continue to, which is the stressful part because you don't have a regular paycheck. But the reason it worked, it was a lot of it was word of mouth. People would say, hey, they would send me an email, Margaret, I'm doing this project and um, somebody recommended you and could you do this with me? Um, and, and that's just because I did a good job in the past. And there are times where I did not do a good job. There are times where I didn't turn any, something in or I didn't meet their expectations. And those people, that that pathway was shut off to me. You know, I don't even know where it would have gone, but it was shut off. Um, so that's, does that answer and help a bit? Yeah. And then if that is the answer, I will have a follow-up question. One of yeah. the five or fewer most important skills that you have learned in the graduate school, but you're still applying them in your work experience. And what are the five most important skills that you have learned as you are working, uh, leaving from the graduate school, but you think they are very important for us to develop now for right. in order to okay. elsewhere. Right. Um, so the thing in grad school, I think that I learned um, that was really important. Uh, my graduate school advisor <clears throat> was very, um, he was very particular about my writing. And that was not because he was trying to make me a writer. He said to me one time, and I won't <laughs> forget, he's like, look, poor writing he said, I consider poor writing to be a sign of poor thinking. And well, I was like, I do not want to be thought of as a poor thinker. So <laughs> I'm going to be learning. And he was also very, um, you know, he would look through my work and be very, he wanted it very precise. And the meaning had to be clear is what, what I learned that precision writing in grad school. And I am very, very grateful for that. Um, what else did I learn in grad school? Well, I mean, in terms of science communication, I learned about how science works or doesn't work. And I think um, that was important in working in science education and curriculum development because a lot of people doing, you know, a lot of K-12 teachers don't have the actual research experience. So they have kind of an idealized version of what science is. And I think that is, um, that doesn't help the students. So for example, you all have been taught, you know, we were all taught that there's the scientific method, right? And now we get to grad school and we're like, well, wait a minute. Actually, sometimes it goes this way and sometimes it goes that way and there's no the method. And um, uh, I remember being kind of paralyzed when I was younger thinking there was the method and I must be doing it wrong. So, um, I guess that's another thing in grad school. What else? I don't know. <laughs> Let me go back to the, to the other thing. Um, <laughs> um, after learning afterwards, maybe. Um, uh, one of the things that I think is hard in moving from grad school to work is that work and school are not the same thing. They are. Um, you apply what you learn in school to work, but um, you have to kind of change your mindset a bit when you get to a job. And the, the main thing is this, when you're in school, 
it's pretty much your experience is pretty much about you, right? Because you're trying to build your knowledge base and you're trying to like m do something important for the science, right? Um, when you go out to work, it's no longer about you. It's about the work and it's about the like the place that you work for and what their mission and their goals are. Ideally, your goals and your vision and, and your cult like your values align with theirs. But if they don't, theirs have precedent, not yours. <laughs> um, so where I've seen people have problems and by problems, I mean, they don't fit right or it's, um, you know, they can even get in trouble is when they come into something and try to input, it's all, you know, they want to keep the, it's kind of about me mindset. Does that? Does that make sense? I'm not trying to be harsh here. It's just the reality of the situation. And certainly when I went in, I think I could have done better. I would have been more successful at AMNH, say, if I had gone in being like, you know, this is a real job. Like this is, I need to be professional, you know? <laughs> um, I felt like I got a lot out of it and it, you know, but I think I could have done better and I could have done more for them. And um, had I had a slightly different attitude toward it. Um, so that's one thing. Let's see. Um, I think um, you need, you know, every, everybody needs to be prepared to make mistakes. Um, mistakes, if you don't make mistakes, it probably means you're just kind of sitting there and doing nothing. <laughs> so, um, so, you know, it's all about what we do with our mistakes um, uh, rather than kind of getting mired in them or <clears throat> or defensive or like shoving them aside. It's like, hmm, what can I learn from that? How can I take that and actually build on it? It's just like in science, you know, you do an experiment, your hypothesis, you've disproven it. You're not going to be like, well, actually, Hmm, I'm just going to throw this data out and say actually that I did prove it. No, you learn from it and you think, well, maybe I need to change this or this or this. So I think that's really important because, um, yeah, it can be hard. Um, and I, I think that the things that are really important in, in the work world, in grad school, I think a lot of us come out thinking, <clears throat> You know, it's our knowledge and our skills, our technical skills that are most important, but it's, and they are no doubt, right? They're really important, but it's the interpersonal um, skills and the communication skills that really make a difference. Like I would much, I did a lot of hiring, okay? And I did want to hire people who are extremely confident, um, uh, competent rather, but what I find is that the people I want to work with are not just competent, they're people who are good to work with. And that's people who listen, people who work through problems, people who don't think that they're the greatest um, in the world. And uh, people, I, I'm not a big on competition, honestly. Um, <clears throat> so it's people who are good to work with. Um, I don't know if that answers some of your question <laughs> there, Grace. Yeah, it does. And then we have a question coming in from Will. Mm -hmm. So do you see, Will, do you want to read your question? Yeah, sure. Um, so I was just curious if you see um, like more opportunities in science communication and outreach popping up um, as it seems like, you know, groups like NSF are pushing broader impacts and inclusion and diversity and just kind of a, a more openness in STEM fields. Does that translate into more jobs or is that just work getting piled on top of people who are already doing other things? Um, I don't know for sure the answer to that, but I think it will translate to more jobs because, um, because you can't do everything. So sometimes people are trying to you know, they're trying to do outreach and their science, and that's very hard. So I think that probably will translate to more jobs. One thing I wanted to actually, I'm glad you brought up that part about inclusion and diversity. Um, there's a, another thing I, I would highly recommend for people. 
um, which is when you're um, when you're out looking for a job, like keep your a CV, a full, full, full CV. And, and what I mean is have a document somewhere with everything, including like, you know, I had a snow cone stand out front of my house <laughs> or I was a squeegee kid or whatever, because um, people are looking for people with, a lot of organizations are looking for people with more diverse experience, not just like the one focused. And that's not to say that if you have that, you're in trouble. Don't worry, because <laughs> there's always room for that. But, you know, when I was, um, I remember in high school thinking, oh, well, you know, I don't, I, I would never have a job at, you know, McDonald's or whatever, because that's just so beneath me and not useful. And at the time, it wouldn't have been seen as a positive. But the fact is, when I'm looking at people who, you know, to work, there are positives in that. Like there's positives in a kind of a crappy job because you learn lots of other skills that you would never learn in a, um, in a, you know, I say a more academic job. Um, so that's part of it. And that gets to the diversity and inclusion part. Well, because we are trying, and this is true at the Institute, uh, the Institute is making a very, very specific effort to try to have a more diverse and inclusive workforce because uh, number one, it's the right thing to do. <laughs> number two, right now we um, our uh, uh, workforce is not representative of say Baltimore City. Um, number three, uh, I think you've all probably noticed this. Um, <clears throat> In your own experience and you know studies show but this is kind of common sense in a way that a more diverse team is more creative and more productive um, and we can then reach broader audiences that way too it's kind of hard to reach a broad audience with just one you know a very um, homogeneous um, set of people trying to do that so what was my point i do think that there probably will be more opportunities out there um, because that's one way to build the STEM pipeline is getting that uh, more um, more information out there. And traditionally, the people who are really deep into research, they either don't have time or have not developed the skills to reach that general audience. Um, it's not that they can't, and it's not that's a general statement. But does that answer your question at all? Yeah. No, that was great. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else? Do we have more questions? Otherwise, I will ask one. The last question, because we are at 56. So you talk about different work experience that you have mm -hmm. after graduation. But I assume at the end of each job, when you're trying to switch, you will face the same situation like we are about to graduate. What's next? How to change? How did you? prepare for that moment of nothing to do and uh, that anxiety that how did you handle those emotions because we have right. students who are about to graduate and then they are thinking about what's next but yeah. i'm sure that moment is not pleasant um no and you know as a freelancer and an independent consultant that moment is every waking minute <laughs> so <laughs> Um, <laughs> yes, um, it is very stressful. So here's a few top tips for you, <laughs> okay? <laughs> um, number one, build your networks so that when the time comes to switch something, you already have, you know, your feelers out there, right? Like I said before, do good at your job because the fact is, <clears throat> somebody who's competent and good to work with, um, there's not enough for those people. You have a leg up <laughs> when you do that. And nothing beats a glowing recommendation, a personal recommendation. So build your network out. Um, grad school, here's something that might sound a little strange, but I highly recommend when you leave grad school and get your first job um, or your second or whatever, <laughs> um, 
continue to live as frugally as you can. Like keep living like a student, maybe not with all the slobby mess and, you know, <laughs> beer cans everywhere. But what I mean is don't immediately uh, change your, um, your lifestyle to match your new pay. Because when you get a pay increase, the problem is this, when you start making more money and you start living on more money, it gets harder and harder. Your, your options start to shrink because now you're thinking, well, I could go do that fun job and join the Peace Corps or whatever, but I would have to give up my fancy car and my house and, you know, whatever. Um, that's a real thing. <laughs> and there are many times I've wished, you know, we like we, for example, we moved and we had a house that had a low mortgage and we moved to a bigger house, which I'm very grateful for now, but um, with a higher mortgage. And when I left words and numbers, it was like, shoot, I really wish that uh, we still had that lower mortgage. And, you know, um, but I couldn't take a job doing, say, I was a park ranger or whatever, because I, we could not afford it. Um, so just keep that in mind. The longer you can kind of like live frugally and save, it's not only good for saving money, but it's good for keeping your options open. Um, uh, the other thing I would say, um, in terms of stress and anxiety. Yeah, so keep your options open, take risks on new things. Um, that that job, that uh, opportunity where I went on the Mid-Ocean Ridge, that was, I saw a flyer in, in the department at, in the middle of the night. Like, uh, you know, I was there working at night, saw a flyer, it said, we need volunteers to go on this trip. I was like, okay, that might be interesting. And then my professor was like, do it, do it, do it. And that opened up a whole new set of a whole new world. So um, does that help? Okay. Yeah, I think it's really <laughs> helpful. Um, so we are about 1 p.m. Do you still have any suggestion that you would like to give us? Um, let me just see, okay. Uh, I guess the other thing I would just say, um, there's two things Richard recommended. <laughs> One, imposter syndrome. That is common. Mm -hmm. Most of us have it at some point. And just keep in mind that most of us are winging it to some extent or another. Like, <laughs> just do your best. And um, yeah. Um, also, this especially goes for women, um, I would say. Uh, I think a lot of us are given the myth that we can have it all. And the fact is no one can have it all. Okay. And I say that not as a downer. I say it as a don't feel bad that you can't have it all. <laughs> There's only so many hours in the day and we can't change the laws of physics. So um, there are people ha you have to make choices sometimes and that's just that's just life and it doesn't make you more or less successful it's just the way it is um, um but I, I think there's i know a lot of people i have a lot of friends who you know they they i think they're just disappointed that they can't be the best mom and the pta president and the this and the that and do their research career and work you know and get twenty thousand papers published and you know, and take care of their parents and dog. <laughs> so it, it it's hard. It it can be hard, and that's the way it is. So uh, <laughs> I don't know if that, that that's kind of yeah. What I would say. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. I really learned a lot. Um, so I hope everyone enjoyed it. And I think this is a truly successful first seminar of the semester. Thank you so much, Margaret, for oh. giving us the... Mm -hmm. no, no problem. No problem. If anybody has any questions or wants to reach out or talk, um, and if you're specifically interested in science writing and science communication, including design, art, web development, whatever, let me know and I can talk to you about it some more. Thank you so much. Okay, I think that's the end of the seminar. And
I will see you guys next week.